This week we're into the roebuck season and for one stalker it's a long haul up a hill. The South Somerset ferreters go out with night vision and rifles. Why is that, Jaff? Rabbits, rabbits and more rabbits tonight, Shirley. Gamekeepers or no gamekeepers? For the grey partridge the answer is black and white. We get a record number of entries to our 450 quid Wordly Airgun competition and this week on Field Sports Extra we're giving away £130 worth of hearing protection. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. I feel very privileged to have won the, uh, the competition and uh, for somebody to take me out for some proper stalking for free, uh, what more can you want? Um, if I'm successful and, uh, and bag an animal, then you know, that's just the icing on the cake. Tom, what, what do you reckon we will see today? Well, on the way up here, we've already noticed seen some deer out grazing already. Uh, so we've got some red deer out grazing in the valley there, and we've also got a few roe. Um, one of them, I think, is the buck we are going to go in after. Um, but so first, we're going to go shoot the target. And I've done my homework. Um, which is what I do if I'm not on back-to-back -back days with clients. So if I've got time, I'll go out day before and scan what I've got. Um, saw plenty of row out yesterday. I've seen one real old one, actually, which I mentioned to you earlier, which we are going to have a look at later. Um, hopefully we can find him. And yeah, if I can get nice. Apparently, he's, apparently he's called Charlie, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we can find him, that'd be great. And you know, if we don't, like Nigel said, it's, yeah, it's somewhere different for Nigel. Yeah, different views. We run weekly competitions on our Tuesday night show, Field Sports Extra, with prizes worth from hundreds to thousands of pounds. Okay. This week, Field Sports Nation member Nigel <laughs> Appleton from Cornwall has won a deer stalking outing after a roebuck. Some of our prize winners are overseas. This one's an easy one. Nigel has to drive just an hour up the road to Dartmoor in order to take up his prize with Tom Davis of Dartmoor Deer Services. With all new clients, I will bring them up here and we'll shoot the target. Um, the target I get clients to shoot is roughly five inches by six inches, which is, you know, it's a good kill zone plate. You know, if, if a client can put two shots in on that for me before we have a stalk in, we're good to go. The range where I do all my zeroing only goes out to 100 yards, so I have absolute confidence in myself and my rifle out to 100. Um, I would feel so comfortable. I would feel comfortable going out <laughs> to 150 because I've got a ballistic turret on this. I, you know, I haven't shot it out at 200 or 300, so there's no way that I'd want to shoot at that range anyway. We head back to the buck that Tom saw earlier and assess the situation. Uh, so you're caught up on the thermal, a buck just chilling out, um, snoozing away up in the top of the valley there. I think it is the same buck that I've been seeing here, which is what we've come here for. We're after this buck. Um, but where he is, he is um, he's in a very awkward position. He's just inside the gate of the field, um, so we can't we can't make a move on it yet because you know, if we move into there, it's gonna well, we just won't get a shot on it. It's about ten yards in, so um, we just have to do the waiting game, be patient, I think, and let him move out, start grazing, and then we can um, make a move to what direction he goes. And you just seen another one move as well? Yeah, um, this is another one which I've been seeing. I haven't identified it yet, um, so I haven't wanted to disturb it, um, but. It, exactly like on time it's come out of the cops exactly where i've been seeing it so which is great yeah what is it uh it's a row <laughs> but i don't know if it's a buck or doe it's yes yeah, it's, it's a long 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 way off that one moves further out into the field and it's identifiably a doe so out of season today back to our buck we are on one side of a valley the buck is on the other tucked into the corner of a field next to the gate which is the only access and surrounded by other deer hidden in the rough ground if we attempt the climb, we could spook an animal which will bump our buck. If we don't, we won't get anywhere near it. <coughs> so they're going to spook. I reckon they'll move up. They always go to the top here. They'll move up all the time. Tom reckons it's a waiting game. We need the buck to move to a better position. A dog walker passes about 50 yards below our buck and just 20 yards from a hidden doe. Amazingly, both deer are obviously used to walkers, neither of them budge. And that dog is no deer hound. Tom finally makes the decision. We walk. It's a steep climb, and while Tom strides ahead, Nigel and I are slower. 
Our timing is good. As we walk up, our buck decides to move. He was going up across this field to the left. It hasn't gone far, and as we top the next rise, we can see it on the other side of the field, about 70 yards away. It is accompanied by a doe which is looking straight at us, but the doe doesn't spook. The buck is also facing us, so is not presenting a shot. After several minutes, it looks like it's going to turn broadside, and it starts scratching at the ground. It's not bloody lie down. Now we have another agonising wait. The doe has disappeared. If it walks out beside us, it will spook. Eventually, as the light starts to go, the buck starts to look restless and stands up. Let's look at that shot again. You can see the fur fly, but Tom can't from where he is standing. There was no flinch, no reaction, and you know, I did actually say I, it was a clean mess and through my bar nose is what it looked like and I, I followed it all the way to the side here. I couldn't see any blood coming out either. And then he just, he dropped here, right next to us. As with, with all of these things, it, it, he, he got up. I was concerned that he was going to disappear, um, but I came up his leg. I was pretty certain that I'd aimed at just the nice spot, you know, a third of the way out the body, up the back of the leg pull the trigger and then same as you he yeah. just legged it and I thought why isn't he why isn't he fallen over and then I got this uh, encouraging note in my ear you missed it <laughs> <laughs> and then fortunately just as it got to the literally just as it got to the, the edge of the woodland I suddenly saw it throw, yeah. itself, throw itself over onto its back and that was it. Nigel is using a 168 grain copper hit bullet by RWS it's copper, it's runoff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that'd be interesting to see. Um, yeah, I mean, it was only 70 metres yeah. using a 308. Yeah. You know, it's bullet may have passed through without hitting any rib. Yeah, situations like that, like I'm looking for, is a reaction or yeah. and sound as well. I'm listening for the thud. So like, if that had gone through the hedge there, the first thing we would have done is gone to that shot site and looked. Uh, he's, de he's definitely passed, he hasn't moved, he's there. So it'd uh, be interesting to see what... Uh, well, I'd love to know where, where I hit it. They go and take a look. So that's the exit. It's yeah. perfect. The bullet has knocked out one lung and the top of the heart, doing exactly what it promises on the box. Only one question remains. Who carries the carcass back? <laughs> um, I'll be polite as a giveaway, so I'll do it. It's no you shot it, you drag it this time. There you are. All part of the service. For more about Dartmoor Deer Services, search for it on Instagram or Facebook or follow the links in the description below. Thanks, Tom and Nigel. And Tom successfully hauled the animal off the hill and back to the larder. Next, let's go to our very own drag artist. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. A Norwegian photographer has posted a video of a protected sea eagle that's been killed by a turbine. Laney Harbach says the bird was found at one of Europe's biggest wind farms in Affjord on the 1st of May. She accused the Norwegian government of not caring about the eagles and not listening to critics of wind turbines. A recent estimate of bird deaths from wind turbines in the United States alone puts the number at more than a million per year. The National Trust policy of banning Muirburn made last month's Marsden fire worse, says a former newspaper editor. More than 100 firefighters, a helicopter and gamekeepers from nearby estates battled the blaze in the Peak District. As we reported last week, the National Trust thanked fire services but ignored the contribution of local keepers. The charity says it is assessing the loss of precious habitat, according to the Times. The paper quotes the former Daily Telegraph editor Charles Moore, who says the Trust and the RSPB's joint campaign against the controlled burning of heather on moors created conditions for wildfire to spread because there are no longer any fire breaks. North Wales police are investigating after an osprey nest was vandalised. The nest at Clinbreneg was cut down with a chainsaw. It was being used by a pair and the female had recently laid an egg. Locals are shocked and the police are appealing for information. 
The UK's gun licensing system is trying to catch up with a new trend in modular firearms. Home Secretary Pity Patel has released amended rules saying that from now on, all serial numbers or identifying marks on barrels, bolts, magazines, receivers, stocks and other parts must now be recorded on gun certificates. Until now, the rules only ask for one serial number. The new rules do not, however, address whether a gun owner needs to apply for a variation in order to replace a gun part that does not alter its calibre. A hunt saboteur has been convicted of common assault. On Wednesday the 28th of April, Central Kent Magistrates Court found Anthony Robinson of no fixed abode guilty of common assault against a hunt supporter. The assault took place near Edenbridge in Kent on the 5th of November 2019. Robinson was fined £180 with costs of £325 and a victim surcharge of £32. Meanwhile, former Jed Forest huntsman Lee Peters has been found not guilty of hunting after claims by Scottish hunt sabs. The SumUp contactless payment system has cut off a shooting range owned by an Olympic gold medalist. According to Richard Foles, owner of Owls Lodge Shooting School near Winchester, the range was given virtually no notice that SumUp would no longer support its business model. The payment company says its terms and conditions list shooting sports in the same category as terrorism. South Africa plans to ban breeding lions in captivity. The controversial captive bred lion or CBL industry supplies big cats to petting zoos as cubs and later in their lives to hunting areas. There is also a trade in lion parts to the Far East for traditional Chinese medicine. A government appointed panel of mainly animal rights supporters recommends slaughtering the estimated 8,000 CBLs, about a quarter of the world population, leaving just 3,500 wild lions in South Africa, mainly on hunting ranches. Lion breeders say the remaining wild animals will now attract poachers, supplying the Chinese medicine market. Environment Minister Barbara Creasy told reporters, we don't want captive breeding, captive hunting, captive petting, captive use of lions. Instagram has disabled the account of Safari Club International board member Brit Longoria. The social media company shut down the renowned Hunter's account after complaints from antis across the world. SCI called the band a deliberate attempt by big tech and anti-hunters to de-platform and silence hunters who promote sustainable and ethical hunting. An African hunting organisation says bans by Western countries is the same as taking food and water from people's mouths. President of the Namibia Professional Hunting Association, Deneen van der Westhuizen, says her country has few resources other than wildlife, so the impact of bans on trophy imports are devastating to the economy and people's lives. It's absolutely devastating to have international restrictions like hunting bans or even just the, the ban of uh, the importation of trophies into country or even as simple as an airline that refuses to fly firearms. It's literally taking food and water out of people's mouths because in Namibia we are completely dependent on it. And it's so sad that people don't understand that we all want the same thing. We all want a better wildlife. We all want a better habitat and the survival of the species. US Fish and Wildlife Service caught a massive sturgeon in the Detroit River. The six foot 10 inch 240 pound whopper was snapped with a member of the river conservation crew on the deck of their boat before being released back into the water. It's thought to be 100 years old. China is allowing hunting and shooting again. Following a temporary ban in the wake of the COVID pandemic, a hunting safaris operator is offering pheasant shooting in Baoxi, western Shangxi province in the centre of the country and is also running English sporting clay shoots with traps supplied by UK trap manufacturer Bowman and clothing company Shooter King. And finally, an otter with expensive tastes has eaten thousands of pounds worth of koi carp. CCTV captured the otter eating the fish that it's caught in a garden pond. The initial prime suspect had been a local heron before the camera captured the brazen otter in the act. The pond's owner installed safety nets and protective wiring over the pond in Edinburgh, but they proved no obstacle for the greedy animal. And you can see a fox waiting for the scraps. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts.
Thank you, David. And I am glad to report I'm getting the first letters in our Right to Boris campaign, which means Boris is too. That's the campaign in which we are asking everyone who hunts, shoots and fishes to send Boris a letter with a stamp on it to number 10 Downing Street explaining what you are looking forward to next season. And in case you're worried that Boris or Carrie will simply bin those letters, send me a copy of your letter and we will turn them into a lovely prime ministerial presentation book. We are aiming for a ton of letters. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash write to Boris. There's a link in the description below for all the details you will need. Now the South Somerset ferreters have packed up their ferrets, but tonight they are out rifle shooting rabbits. Look out rabbits, the South Somerset ferreters also have rivals. Normally we see Jaff and his furry friends, and of course by that I mean his ferrets, disappearing down holes in hedgerows. Tonight he is on the back of his truck, driven by his brother Paul with gate opening provided by Murray. Rabbits, rabbits and more rabbits tonight, Shirley. We're going to visit three different farms tonight. The farms we're visiting, we don't ferret. We always just stick to shooting, you know, because I like to keep ferreting and shooting separate. So the three different farms we're going on tonight, we should get at least, I'm going to say 20 rabbits tonight. So Mainly to fill my freezer up to feed my ferrets, really. The exercise is straightforward. Jaff finds with the light, Paul stops. Jaff aims with the night vision. Jaff shoots, Murray collects. Paul watches the whole thing on telly in the cab. Right then. More sort of over there, what you're all. Straight ahead, comp. That's three and two, well, what, two minutes? So we're doing all right. Kind of helps if you put your mag in there. <laughs> Technical issues here. All right, there's one around there somewhere, Muzz, I think. Swing round left, comes a couple of rabbits. With all these rabbits available, how does Jaff choose whether to shoot land or ferret it? I sit him down in daylight to ask that question. A lot of the um, decision is made on the type of hedges and stuff. Um, obviously, real big thick hedges, a nightmare to... And it also depends if the landowners want all the rabbits gone. So I mean, you can go in and on a good day's ferreting and completely clear you know, 99% of, of a burrow, really. With shooting at night, you can actually see the numbers. If you want to completely eradicate it, you, you go out all the time shooting. If not, once or twice a year on a good night out, just to control the numbers, you know, which I find really works. Yeah, a lot of people go out and they'll, they'll take three or four rabbits from a burrow and, and that's their day, you know. Again, all depends on on the landowner or the farmer. If they want the rabbits gone, then you've got to go in and do that job for them, you know. Like yesterday, I just, ordered a new scope, nearly a thousand quid, just for a night vision scope. Um, but you can go out with a torch and a lamp and an air rifle if you really wanted to. So it ranges from three or four hundred quid up to, well, thousands, you know. Ferreting equipment, you can start with a bag of purse nets and a ferret. Then you're going into your ferret finders, your collars, and that's when all the, you know, the price starts going up. I'm pretty well set up in both fields, you know. Over the years, I think I've massed about 4,000 quid of a ferreting gear, um, and probably the same in, in lamping gear, you know. Now, back to the shooting, and before he buys that wonderful new scope, Jaff's setup includes an old night sight scope attachment, a Yukon video recorder, and an extra infrared torch to bump up the illumination. And that extra IR is one thing he won't be giving up. It just makes that subtle bit of difference of an extra illuminator, you know. Every little helps. It's funny, because... I'm seeing rabbits where I haven't seen them before 
And where there have been rabbits in the past, the numbers have gone sort of down, so they're reappearing in different places now. Are they avoiding places where they all died out of RHD and things like that? Could you be, you never know. I mean, who knows? Have you had any mixy rabbits tonight? No, not tonight. That's good to know. No. Um, yeah, I haven't seen any sign of mixy at all, which is great. Uh, yeah, as I said, the rabbit numbers are starting to come back, I think. Um, until I start shooting them, they start to decline again. <laughs> but now we'll, you know, I love my rabbit shooting, um, and that's why I keep it separate to be ferreting, you know. You can find the South Somerset Ferreters on YouTube and Facebook. Links in the description below. Thanks, Jaff, Paul and Murray for a great night out. Now we have dug out a bargain hunter for you. Do you need shooting sticks? Laza shooting sticks are down to £199 from £270 at Clooney Country Store and they are available from the Clooney Country Store website. No codes required while stocks last. I've put a link in the description below. Next up, grey partridges. One of the most treasured sites in the British countryside, a covey of native English partridges, and it's only thanks to shooting and keepering that we have them at all. News editor Ben O'Rourke discovers that if the aunties want to see grey partridges, they're going to have to get used to snaring. Another partridge hotspot. There's a couple pairs along here. Um, they tend to be in this winter wheat, and uh, you don't see them until it's too late. Mike Swan from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust is driving me around a southeast England estate in a rickety old Land Rover that could do with a wash. This is the farm Land Rover. I've got first call on it. Other people can have it if they, if they want to. And if I keep it shabby enough, most people don't want to use it. Mike has been working for the GWCT since the early 1980s. Over the years, he got to know the landowner here who asked him to run the shoot. When he decided to change the way the shoot was running, he just offered it to me one day. He said, uh, you've always said this ought to be looked after for partridges rather than being a, a driven pheasant shoot. Would you like to take it on? The whole concept all along had been run it to produce wild pheasants, to run an armed nature ramble sort of shoot where we could invite a few friends and the owner's family all go for a, a ramble together and end up with enough game in the bag at the end of the day that everybody could take a brace of birds home for dinner. Um, and if we had a happy day doing that together, then that was the whole raison d'etre. Since then, he's been sticking to the three-legged stool model for creating an attractive environment for grey partridges. They need the right habitat. They need food throughout the life cycle and they need reasonable freedom from being eaten by something else. Grey partridges are open country birds. So this bit of the estate that we're on with the big fields is the ideal environment for them. So this bit of barley is part of the countryside stewardship scheme that the estate is in. It's fantastic brood rearing habitat for grey partridges. As that barley grows up, it then forms a canopy, broadleaf weeds underneath, with little creepy crawly insects, which are the important food source for the partridge chicks. And then nesting cover in the hedgerow on that side, nesting cover in the beetle bank. There's plenty of places to hide, food source and so on. So everything's there to hold a pair of partridges and then provide them with what they need to rear a family. The grassy banks, the grassy hedge uh, bottoms and so on, those are the places where they're gonna nest and they're gonna actively avoid nesting somewhere near any significant numbers of trees. If you fill the hedgerows with trees, you lose your partridges, they don't like that. So the second part of the story is food. And of course, partridges, everybody thinks of partridges, a bit like a chicken, feeds on seeds, uh, spilt grain uh, and, and weed seeds and so on and so forth. And that's right, that's the adult diet. Just as we're inspecting one of the feeders, several Mad March hares catch our eyes. What you'll have there is a female that's nearly ready to mate and five blokes who think they're in with a chance. <laughs> the predation control that we do for the partridges is enormously beneficial to the hares, the foxes in particular. Not far away at a feeder, we spot some greys at last. That hopper is full of wheat and they'll be using that whenever they feel peckish and they will probably nest within 30 or 40 yards of that hopper. Most likely in the hedge behind us, Mrs. Partridge will lay upwards to 15 or even 18 eggs, biggest clutch of eggs of any bird species in the UK. Um, and she will then sit on them 
he will stay in attendance. He's a very loyal um, uh, other half. He'll stay in attendance and he will um, call her off on a daily basis and keep an eye open for trouble while she feeds. Whereas it, the red legs, they're much less, um, much less bothered about the loyalty thing. Um, a cock red leg will quite happily run two different establishments if he gets the opportunity to do so. The grey partridge was once Britain's top game bird, with two million shot each year between 1870 and 1930, according to the National Game Bag Census, which goes back to 1793. Changes in farming saw numbers crash 40% after the Second World War. Today, grey partridges are a sign of farmland managed with wildlife in mind. Mike explains why. They're an indicator of the health of a farmed landscape, if you like, because they need the insects, the, the, the larval forms of the insects, to feed the chicks. And those insects are so much the bottom of the food chain for so many other things as well. So if the partridges are doing well, the land is not being farmed um, too intensively over the whole lot. And all of that comes together and in the process helps a whole range of other species. If you want a healthy population of partridges on your ground, you've got to stop them from being eaten by too many things too frequently. So predation control is also a very important part of the project. It's a crucial part of what we do here, uh, and that forms the third leg of the little stool. Mike takes me on a tour of traps around the estate. Between them, they've knocked the water bottle off the thingy. He waters the crows in his Larsen traps and feeds them dog food. I feed complete diet, dog food, kibbles. Um, if you give them muesli type dog food, they pick out what they like and throw the rest away. Although the dog biscuits don't make the birds' coats any shinier. As I say, complete diet, dog food, and a bunny drinker. Um, and they don't then poo in their water supply and make it dirty. Right, so the third leg of that stool is freedom from being eaten by other things, or reasonably so, uh, which means predation control. And I choose that term predation control very carefully because it's not about how many predators I'm killing, it's about how much predation I'm preventing. And that's a very, very important distinction. I shouldn't be um, attempting to do the Victorian and Edwardian keeper thing of making predators go extinct. I should be living with them, but managing the predation that they cause. One weasel that has fallen foul of the new Perdix PX3 trap um, that is one of the few that are now legal for controlling stoats in the UK. Um, and clearly it would be daft for me to set a trap that risks catching a stoat if it weren't a trap that's legal for catching stoats. There is still a lot of work to do to bring the bird back to pre-war levels. The estate is one of several in the area that are part of great partridge conservation schemes. Because neighbours have got going on a proper wild partridge project as well, we're now in the ascendancy a bit, where I think over a long, long period of time, what I've basically done is export a few pairs into the hinterland. I'm now exchanging them over the boundary, and that means that, we're, as I say, we're in a growth phase. Thank you, Ben. And it's worth saying that Ben's films, such as that one about the great partridge, are only on this channel thanks to the support of the Field Sports Nation. Who are the Field Sports Nation? They're our group of 1,500 supporters who get to watch Field Sports Extra on Tuesday nights exclusively for them. It's a TV show that includes our weekly prize draws. Last week we gave away a £450 air gun from Webley. This week it's £130 worth of hearing protection from Isotunes, the new in-ear bud, the Isotunes Advance. And how do you get to join the Field Sports Nation? Well, there's a link in the description below. Follow that and it'll give you all the details. Now, from Hampshire to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube.
This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Thanks to Dwayne Cross from the Wash Wildfowler Field Sports Channel for sending me this. He went out with Robin from Team Foxer to a grain store with a fen drain at the back of it and achieved a tally of more than 100 rats. Nigel Appleton contacted me before his roe stalking outing with Tom Davis and pointed me to this film on the Servile channel, Roe Deer Shot Placement and Reaction. It turns out, of course, he didn't need it, but it's good he can find it on YouTube. Spanish hunting channel Jara y Sedal is putting out a run of of unusual wildlife films, including this peruke roebuck with antlers so enormous the animal can't see. Ian Law sends me this film, his best spring days fishing ever, four salmon off the Isle of Mouth beat on the River Tay in April 2021, out from his channel Scottish Outdoor Life. That's down in the Glen, up on the tops with the 2021 UK wildfire season, one of the worst in recent memory. The National Gamekeepers Organisation has got together with TGS Outdoors to put out this documentary on the subject. In Australia, McHugh CB knocks over a big dog fox with his 20 gauge Chiapa Triple Crown and his trusty Daxons. Here's one of the biggest gun films of the week. Kentucky Ballistics puts out the simply titled My 50 Cal Exploded, which incredibly he survives and spends this video explaining what happened. And finally, the Funker 530 Gun Channel puts out this film about the US Army's new augmented reality goggles and how they show the world as 1970s sci fi. David found this one and asks, Hunting next? That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. And that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website fieldsportschannel.tv where you can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. Best of all, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about the show Field Sports Britain at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye.